10, 9, 8. Can you hear me, Ziller? 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Hey, everybody, welcome to the John DeVito Show and King Ziller of Dr. Pepper said that he can hear me so we're good to go maybe i've worked out these boomer problems that i'm having in my studio so hey we're going to take a break from politics today we're going to talk to jeff moore from the more money podcast and this should be a good one because he is a financial expert and who can't use more money in life right so this should be a good show i'm looking forward to interviewing him it's not going to be just about money it's going to be about his podcast and some of the things that he talks about it on a daily basis. So I hope everyone's doing well, and we'll be at it in a second. Welcome to the show, Eric. Good to see you, brother. And good morning, John. And um, and I just let him know that we're live now. If, hopefully he'll be joining us momentarily. All right. Hey, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the John DeVito Show. And Eric, you made a few comments while the music was playing, and I couldn't really hear you. Why don't you repeat what you said? Um, Yeah, I just let Jeff Moore know that you're live now via text message. That way, hopefully, he'll be joining us momentarily. (laughs) If he does, he does. If he doesn't, he doesn't. We'll figure it out, but I'm sure he'll be here. He confirmed with us uh, a couple days ago on on, uh, Podbean or on, on Gmail. But you know how it goes. Sometimes you forget. Sometimes things come up. If he comes, great. If not, then we'll just talk and you know, talk about some Mm -hmm. other things. But so did you see this morning on the news, Eric, uh, I was kind of happy to see that it looks like finally the news outlets are saying that the Omicron variant is starting to rescind. So it looks like we've hit our peak and the numbers are going down. So maybe just maybe we can get back to some sense of normal. Do you think that's ever going to happen, Eric? Well, um, Well, hopefully it's like a dwindling down. I, keep, I see King Ziller said no. You know, I, I hate to say it. I think that it's probably going to be with us for a while. But I think that this time, you know, with Omicron, I think we started to really see a lot of resistance from the American people. And we started to see a lot of people standing up for their individual rights. I think that if the government continues to try to, you know, ram this down our throat and mandate us, you're going to see the protests and the uprisings get worse. And I mean, honestly, I don't want to see that. I don't want to see, you know, continued protests. I don't want to see our country constantly divided and people fighting with each other all the time. So I'm hoping that's not going to be the case, but you know, hopefully we can, um, we can get around this somehow. Now, while we're waiting for Jeff, I'm going to tell this story really quickly, Eric, and you may have seen this. Of Mm -hmm. course, I can't post on Twitter still because I'm banned for seven days yet again. I'm such a bad boy. And my wife looked at me the other night and she goes, you know, my daughter, your your daughter told me that you got banned from Twitter again. What did you do this time? I was like, well, I was a bad boy. And honestly, this time, I will admit that I probably deserved to get suspended for seven days. I was on Michelle Wu's page and, you know, she's this communist communist dictator that is destroying the city of Boston right now. And she, I'm going to tell you a story about what happened shortly before we have Jeff come on. But, um, she had posted that she was out with her family eating uh, Chinese food and getting dumplings were part of the things that she was eating. And the food actually looked pretty good. But I made a comment on her tweet that said, I hope you choke on your dumplings. So granted, I probably shouldn't have said that. You know, I guess that is considered bullying. But honestly, I would like to see her choke on your dumplings. And I wouldn't be the least bit upset about that if it happened. So (laughs) but anyway, you know, it is what it is. But let me let me tell you real quick, Eric, what happened. Over the weekend, as you all know, you know, communist dictator, hey, Mr. A, communist dictator, uh, Michelle Wu, uh, put in more like Mayor Karen. Oh, Mayor Karen. She's terrible. But you know what's what's funny about her, though? She's packaged beautifully. She's an attractive young woman. She dresses nice. She's a mother of two. She looks like, you know, the type of woman that everybody would want to be friends with. She seems like a nice person. And maybe she is. And maybe she's being led astray by Elizabeth Warren and the people above her. But the bottom line is, I mean, she has created division in Boston like we've never seen before to the point where, you know, people are protesting outside of her house, you know, 50 deep with bullhorns every morning. And she's calling everybody racist in the city of Boston and all that because she's supposedly a woman of color. She's Asian. I mean, I'm Italian too, but I don't consider myself to be a man of color. You know, it is what it is. But 
What happened over the weekend, her vaccine ID mandate went into effect, okay, in Boston. And, of course, you have people that are going to be going in and they're going to be, you know, trying to get their food without their ID. Now, there's a woman, I'm not going to mention her name yet, but I have reached out to her and I've asked her to come on my show and she's done some other podcasts. She is familiar with my show in the Boston area. This woman was a decorated police sergeant in the city of Boston. She was a hero during the Boston Marathon bombing, where she literally, once the bombs went off, she ran into danger and helped numerous people and prevented death from people during the marathon bombing. She has refused to get her vaccine in the city of Boston, and Michelle Wu has fired her. So this woman now no longer has a job. This is a heroic police officer who saved lives during one of the worst tragedies in the history of Boston, and she was let go. So she went into two restaurants, one called Penguin Pizza in Boston, and the other one is called Regina's Pizzeria in the North End. For those people who are not familiar with Boston, the North End is the traditional Italian area of the city. There's a ton of really good Italian restaurants. They're generally all very expensive, but the food is just out of this world. And Regina Pizzeria is one of the best-known pizza places in the North End that over the years people consider to be the best pizza in Boston. So she went into this restaurant, and again, a decorated police sergeant, who was a hero at the Boston Marathon bombing. The owner would not give her water, would not serve her food. And when she just said, listen, all we want to do is have food. We want to eat our pizza. That's it. The owner of this restaurant called the police and told the police that she was trying to steal food and she was trying to steal things from the establishment. So the police came and they were trying to throw this woman out of this restaurant, a decorated police sergeant who saved people's lives during the Boston Marathon bombing. And that's what the city has come to. But Regina Pizzeria is now seeing fallout, just like Penguin Pizza in Boston as well, where people are going onto their Yelp pages, people are going onto their Google reviews, onto their Facebook reviews, and they're ripping this business, saying that they would never eat in this establishment again. So this is what we're seeing in Boston. This is happening all over the city right now. And like I've said, you know, Boston is a very unique place. Boston is a place, if you think about all the famous people that come out of Boston, the Mark Wahlbergs, you know, the people like that, Boston is a tough city. People think of New York as being a tough city. I think Boston is a tougher city than New York is. With the residents of Boston, many are hardcore Irish Americans, hardcore Italian Americans, and even the people of color are not supporting what Michelle Wu is doing right now. And these are people that will literally burn down the city before they agree with these mandates. Now, what you do have in Boston is you have a bunch of people, these new progressives that have moved in. You've got a lot of very prestigious colleges in Boston. You've got Harvard. You've got Boston college, you've got, you know, tons of of very prestigious, expensive schools where you have these new progressives that are moving into the city. And I think a lot of these progressives, you know, have underestimated the true moxie of the people in Boston and how tough these people can be. And right now they're seeing it. I mean, it was funny, um, a guy by the name of uh, Ed Flynn, who was on the Boston City Council, came out the other day and made a comment that it was disgusting that people were protesting in front of Michelle Wu's house because the people were out there, you know, this one woman who was a police officer is out there protesting in front of her house. She now can't feed her children because the mayor's taken her job away. And, um, she has been protesting with up to 50 people in front of the mayor Wu's house every morning, waking up her children, whatever else, bothering the neighbors. And Wu came out and ripped her in the press. So this guy, Ed Flynn, who's a city councilor, backed her up. So yesterday morning, the group of 50 decided to leave Michelle Wu's house for the day. And they went to Ed Flynn's house and they protested his house. So the funny thing is, I think that if Michelle Wu, Michelle Wu thinks that if she digs her heels in and continues to ram this down the throats of the Boston uh, people, that they're going to eventually accept this. She doesn't understand Boston. Boston will never accept this. She is now going to be a paper mayor mayor in the city of Boston. Everything she does is going to be under a microscope. And the people of Boston will continue to protest. They will continue to fight. They will continue to be in front of her house. They will continue to have marches. They had a march this past Saturday where the local fake news outlets reported that a few dozen people were there. If you look at people's Twitter pages, there were thousands of people at this protest, thousands. It wasn't a few dozen. And it's amazing how this person and this fake news outlet, these fake news outlets will basically put down every 
estimation of how many people were actually there. It's just basically government propaganda. So she did, Kingzilla. She dug a hole. That's exactly what's happening. So, hey, for the people that are in here, while we're waiting for Jeff Moore, hopefully he remembered us today. And if he doesn't, no worries. We'll just go on with some other stuff and uh, talk about a few other things. But um, and actually, we could talk about money. You know, that's something that uh, I take pretty seriously in my life. So if there's anyone in here interested in maybe talking about money and some ways to make money, I can certainly help with that as well. But um, Eric, so what's going on with you, man? How are you doing? And if you, if you guys are in here, if you're new, please uh, follow my show and share my live if you could. That definitely helps me get the word out about my show. I would greatly appreciate it. So, Eric, I mean, what do you think about what's going on in Boston right now? And th- these things are happening in New York. They're happening in Chicago. Yeah. They're happening in L.A. I mean, what you know, what what are they thinking when these vaccine vaccines aren't even working? They're just segregating the population. I mean, why do you think they're doing this, Eric? I mean, I I just think it's like very very sickening, especially the way that one Boston police officer, you know, who, um, you know, who risked, risked, risked her life, you know, to, to, to save people during the Boston bombing. Um, and, um, and, and of course, and, 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 and it's almost like, um, the Boston mayor is just, um, just like thumbing her nose and spitting on that police officer. She is. It's terrible. <clears throat> no, it's terrible. You know, and, Hey, John Gale, welcome to the show. Hey, John, if you want to call in, we were supposed to have Jeff Moore on today, and it looks like maybe Jeff may have forgotten about us, which is fine. No worries about that. I'm sure he's a busy guy. It happens to me all the time. But, John, if you have your headphones and if you want to call in, we'd certainly welcome you as a member of the panel, and you can either take over the co-hosting or uh, just end up you know, holding the, uh, the seat warm for Jeff in, in the event that he does arrive. So no worries for right. Jeff Moore. If he can't do it today, we'll reschedule and talk about uh, some of the things that he was going to talk about. Well, and, and, uh, um, go ahead, Eric. And I know we're certainly looking forward to having Spanky and Scooter join oh. us tomorrow. I'm I'm literally oh, nervous. I bet that's about, gonna be a fun show. I'm nervous about having those two on. I mean, again, luckily I've lost some weight. I've lost almost sixty pounds now, and if I hadn't, I mean, I could have very well had a heart attack on the air with those two. They are absolutely hysterical. And well, I mean, hopefully I, Chuck will show up for that show. Tomorrow. Oh, dude, we have to put together the show where we have Chuck and Billy yeah. along with the beanie, you know, the, the the beans and weenie guys. I mean, honest to God, that could be the most epic comedy podcast in the history of Podbean if we can get those four on together. <laughs> I mean, do you remember some of, some of the shows we had with uh, Chuck and Billy's Not Your Cup of Tea? I had them on when they were first getting started with that new venture. And I know they've been busy yeah. lately and they haven't been on. But, oh, my God. I mean, I don't think I've ever laughed that hard since I was probably like a teenager. I mean, they're just so damn funny. And Beans and Weenie, I mean, oh, my God. I don't know how these guys are not like a morning drive show in some major market in this country. I mean, that is one of the best shows I've ever or heard. I mean, they are so or, professional and so funny, you know. Or they're amazing. You. Or a pay-per-view, like, comedy special. They're amazing. They're amazing. So, hey, John, hey, welcome to the show. I'm glad you called in. So maybe we'll go in your direction today because for the people that have not heard uh, the John Gale show, I get in when I can. I've got, uh, you know, work and then four kids that we're driving around. But if you haven't been into John's show, speaking of professionals, I mean, this guy is right on the mark. He's a man of faith. He's a man that speaks straight to the people that come into his show. Very intelligent man and really, really, really does a nice job with his podcast. So if you haven't been in to John Gale's show, make sure you please check it out uh, every afternoon if you get the chance. And he's really, really is good to listen to. Very entertaining. And I'm still kind of proud that a couple of weeks ago I did really well in your trivia contest. I think I did fairly well in that. I got, got a few <laughs> answers. And it's probably because I'm old, you know. <laughs> probably Thanks, John. Now, will you tell my wife those those nice things that she said about me? Well, it's, it's probably a lot like my wife. You know, I'll tell my wife I'm going to go in and do a podcast and I get the eye roll, you know, <laughs> all this stuff. So I uh, believe me, I get it. You know, my wife is is a good person, but uh, not always 100% supportive in, in some of the ventures I do in my life. But I guess that's what makes me exciting also. I'm always doing something different and trying new things. So um, I wanted to ask you, John. So we were just talking a little bit about Boston and what's going on. I mean, obviously, uh, this is yeah. important to me. So did you see, I was telling Eric the story about the uh, police officer the sergeant who was fired from her job, she was a hero at the Boston Marathon. She saved people's lives when the explosion happened. She ran to help these people and was a hero on the site. She was decorated by the city of Boston. But now, now because she refuses to take the vaccination, she's been fired. And then she went into a very well-known pizza very place, or actually two of them, 
uh, Penguin Pizza and then Regina Pizzeria in Boston, both establishments called the police on her and wanted to have her escorted out of the building. And the guy that owns Regina Pizzeria in Boston, I mean, the guy made up lies. She had the whole thing on video. He told the police she was trying to steal food. She was trying to steal money. I mean, this is how the city of Boston is now treating their heroes and to me, it's just horrible. I mean, you know, you're for, you're watching this from afar. I mean, what are your feelings on what's going on in Boston right now? Well, when you said that yesterday, I actually texted you off off to the side and asked for the link and watched that video. It it is an amazing 15 minutes or so. It's a quite a lengthy video because they just let it roll. Right. And I'm telling you what, um, now I've seen since then, John, a couple other videos i don't know if it's in boston or another state where similar people are, are going into restaurants where actually it was no it was a restaurant owner where i believe it was the city of boston they came in and told them you know you you have to do the mask thing right so i don't know if, uh, if you've seen that yet but that's another one that you've got to watch I, i'm telling you what it, it is as if we are living in world war ii all over again john it is frightening to see people just fall in line, get in step with the with the Nazi regime, and go by whatever they say. When they aren't even like in the case of, of Boston, these, these are mandates; these are not laws. And you know, you would think that the police would have something better to do with their time, like go arrest some criminals then harass somebody that's trying to eat. I loved what they did there in Boston where they actually brought in a pizza from another restaurant and ate it in their, in their, at their table. I loved it. But you had said yesterday to go online and leave a review. And I left a review for that penguin pizza. I wanted to make sure that I got it right. So I asked you the correct address because I didn't want to, I guess it's a chain, but I, I left, a review i haven't gone in to see if it's gotten any any responses or any other people who left bad reviews but somebody needs to go in there you know uh, you know at, at some point you got to say the restaurant owner what is he trying to do you know there's more people that would support him if he would not go along with the narrative than when he does well that, that's the thing i mean i think honestly at this point from what I understand, and, and unfortunately, the police officers are getting killed in this situation. When I say killed, they're getting hammered, you know, with verbal complaints and complaints on social media. The police are caught in a very difficult situation. I mean, I, I'll be very clear. I'm a big supporter of police officers, firefighters, their heroes. And again, you know, these police officers, when they're being called into businesses, they can't just not show up. So if this guy in Regina Pizzeria is calling the police and telling the police that this woman is trying to steal and she won't leave the restaurant and she won't show her vaccine ID. I mean, the police officers are required to go to this location and they have to address the situation. I would imagine that if the restaurants in Boston are serving people and not checking vaccine ID cards, then I would imagine that probably nothing's going to come of it unless they specifically call the police. Cause I don't think the police are out really investigating what's going on in individual businesses. So this would basically be kind of like a lame duck law or mandate because a, you know, a mandate is not a law, but this would be a, a lame duck mandate that no one would be following. But when you have businesses like this who are, you know, destroying what the people in Boston have come to accept as far as their city. It's just not right. I mean, Regina Pizzeria, for people that are not familiar with the city of Boston, I mean, that's as, as well known as like Cheers being in Boston. I mean, it's a very, very well known tourist place in the North End where everybody goes. They generally have very good pizza. Personally, I could care less. I think there's good pizza all around the area. So I don't think I need to go into Regina Pizzeria. But this guy, the way he treated this officer, the way he lied to the police, the way he treated her like she was less than human, that's where I have the problem. I mean, again, if this guy owned a business and she came up and ordered pizza and he said, listen, ma'am, I know who you are. I respect what you did. You are a hero in the Boston Marathon bombing. My hands are tied. I can't serve you. And if I serve you, I'm in danger of losing my restaurant and losing my business because Boston is going to find me and they're going to come after me and I can't risk it. I am sorry that I can't serve you. 
you know, let, c- call the mayor of Boston, complain to her office. And if she rescinds this ridiculous mandate, I will gladly serve you and give you a free meal on the house when you come back. I just can't do it right now. And I mean, at least if he treated her with some level of respect, but this was a woman that risked her live, life and saved lives at the Boston Marathon bombing. And she was thrown out and treated like trash at this restaurant. I, I don't care if I'm on the street and I'm starving to death. I would never spend a dime at this restaurant ever again. And I would not recommend it to anybody. I mean, this guy has done, in my opinion, you know, irreparable, irreparable damage to his business. And again, you know, this business is going to fly. They have a lot of people coming in, tourists go in there all the time. So it's not like they're going to go out of business, but I do believe that this restaurant has lost a lot of credibility in the city. And it's funny. Now, if you go in and look at penguin pizza, that was the other business that ripped, uh, this same police officer and wouldn't serve her. And again, called the police. They've gotten, you know, a bunch of negative reviews on Google and on Yelp, but then they've had a bunch of their cronies go in and leave positive reviews. So there's literally like 20 positive reviews, all five stars, you know, all singing the praise of the restaurant. So they have their own people working overdrive, trying to overcompensate for the negative reviews that they got. And, you know, here's like a little, a little secret to all of you. Maybe just maybe if you would act it with a little bit of kindness, and a little bit of respect, you wouldn't be in the scenario that you're in right now. And I don't think you need to treat people the the way that this person was treated. And if I was this woman, after the things I've done for the city of Boston, and now I can't feed my children because my job's been taken away because of this power-hungry mayor, I mean, honestly, I would never work as a police officer again, and probably I would sue the city of Boston for an unlawful firing because I I, I don't think it's constitutional to fire her and do the things that she's done. And I'm getting some tweets on the side here so let me shut that off so but anyway I'm I'm like, I mean, it's just, it's just crazy. Uh, did you see this morning john it looks like the uh the uh omicron virus is starting to, it's already peaked and it looks like the cases are starting to drop off a shelf right now and they're going way down i think everyone kind of predicted that but as i was saying earlier in the show i don't know if there's going to be any time where these mandates go away generally when you have mandates in place they tend to stay in place i mean do you think that's going to change if this Omicron starts to really die off, or do you think we're going to be looking at these mandates, you know, for the very distant future or the, you know, for the long term? Uh, I think that we're probably going to be stuck with them as long as we have idiots who are in authority over us. Uh, what's the deal with the pizzerias in Boston? You know, I don't understand what has happened to people's, like you say, kindness. There, the government is obviously trying to divide us. And we need to take a stand and realize that all the authorities, they work for us, the people, you know. But I think, uh, don't worry, John, there'll be another variant by the end of the month. (laughs) Well, there's no doubt. I see Bar Ramu podcast saying the UK is about to drop all mandates and guidelines today. I mean, that's a good thing. And I hope that that happens here. But John, to what you just said, let's let's not forget that we have another election coming up at the end of this year. And this election is going to determine who keeps power in Congress here in the United States. And I would not be a bit surprised if we had another big spike where people are going to be required to mail in their votes again, because again, you know, going standing in line to vote is not safe. Of course, here in the city of Boston, we've had people standing in line for four hours, some with COVID, some without COVID, and these people have been waiting for tests. So I guess it's okay to stand in line for four hours in the cold, the subarctic temperatures that you, we get in Boston here in January, And but it's not okay to stand in line to vote because that's dangerous. So that's kind of what we're you know, looking at, I'm sure, by the end of the year. So we'll see what happens. You know, we'll see what happens. But, John, if you could, give everybody a little preview. What are you talking about on your show later on today? I'm glad we have you on. You know, we had a no show from Jeff, and that's okay. Something came up. I'm sure he'll email us at some point during the day, and we'll just reschedule. But this gives me another opportunity to have you on, which I'm really happy about because I've enjoyed um, your show. What's your show going to be about today? Well, as usual, John, we're just going to take a look at the trending news for the day and how it relates to our freedoms being taken away from us. I'm, I'm working on show prep right now. So basically each day right around this time of day, I hop online and work for the next four hours gathering clips and uh, looking for articles that uh, would be you know, important for my listeners to, to hear and to discuss on the show. But in, in aspect to anything particular today – just still working on it, honestly. 
Did you see, this was kind of a funny story from a couple of days ago. And this was a very brief story on the news. And this one I thought was hysterical. Welcome, Walt Weekly. Welcome to Jimmy, whatever that says, <laughs> that came in. Welcome to the show. But uh, there was a story on the news the other day. And this was just an obvious, obvious attempt at left-leaning propaganda. And I thought this was, I literally laughed out loud. I was watching with my wife in the morning. Like our general routine is, you know, we get up pretty early, you know, both of us by six o'clock in the morning. We like to get up and spend a little time together in the morning. We have our coffee. We watch the morning news, primarily for the weather. And we watch all the other stories that come along with it. But there was a story on the news the other day where there was actually a poll done. And this poll said, I'm going to try not to laugh, that I think it was seven out of 10 people find other people wearing masks as to be an attractive trait in that particular person. So I, I, I heard that. I literally had to rewind it. I'm like, what did they just say? And my wife was like, I don't think I heard that right. So we rewound the story back. And they did say that when a person wears a mask, they find that to be attractive. And it was something like 60 or 70 percent of the people felt that that was the case. And, you know, I thought back on my younger years. I mean, there were times because, you know, I was not always a good guy like I am now. I may have run around a little bit when I was younger and I didn't get married till I was 33. It took me a little while to kind of find myself a little bit throughout my 20s. And I always made the joke that some people would have been more attractive with a bag over their head. And I'm sure some women probably felt that way about me. My wife probably feels that way now. But I mean, who, who, who are they trying to kid that people look better with a mask on? I prefer to see a person's face. I mean, how do you, how do you guys feel about that, Erica, John? Well, I tell you, John, I just, uh, if we saw the same uh, news feed, they, they had some psychologist on there afterwards talking about that people looked at it as that you were caring for others and, and, and that you were more compassionate if you wore one. And so that was a part of the attraction. I was like, this guy is nuts. If you can't see somebody's full face, you better get a picture of them to find out what they look like before you start dating them. Exactly. I mean, that, that, to me, I thought that was the funniest story. And that's the other thing that gets me is I love that the people on the left are making the argument, well, if you don't wear your mask and if you don't get your vaccination, you're selfish. You don't care about other people. You don't care about keeping other people safe. I mean, I don't know, but I, 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 get, I worry about a, a narrative and I worry about the media when they're calling freedom selfish. Because again, freedom is what this company, this country is based on. Freedom is the reason why you have millions of immigrants, illegal immigrants, trying to get into this country through the southern border and other places because they all want a taste of that United States freedom. And when you have a government entity that is telling people that freedom is selfish, that concerns me because being free is not selfish. I mean, for them to say that I'm selfish, they know nothing about me. You know, I'm a guy that I have dedicated my life to doing good things for people. Most of those things I never talk about. And, you know, not all of them are on a large scale. For me, you know, I drive into the city of Worcester, which is the major city right next to me in Massachusetts. And I can't tell you the amount of time, the amount of times I have been sitting at a red light and I see a homeless person standing out. And I don't do it to all homeless people because some of them don't look like they're really homeless to me. But occasionally when I see a person that really looks like they're homeless and really looks like they have mental illness and they're probably not going to take my money and run to the, the closest liquor store to buy drugs, you know, I give money all the time. I'll give, you know, a 20 to a homeless person, a 50 if I have it. I had a woman right before Christmas. I was sitting at this stoplight. I always go into this area of Worcester. And I'm sitting in a stoplight and I'm hanging out there and I see this woman on the side of the road with a sign. And oh my God, she was downtrodden. She looks mentally ill. She was dirty. I mean, it was horrible. I literally almost cried when I saw her in my car. And I always think about it. I'm like, okay, maybe I'm a sucker. I'm giving her money. She's going to go buy alcohol, but whatever. So she's there and I pulled on my window. And for me, you know, I, I didn't look at her when I handed her the money and it wasn't really a sign of me trying to be disrespectful. I just felt bad for her and I didn't want her to feel embarrassed by taking the money from me. So I guess I didn't really make eye contact with her. So when I didn't, I just you know hung the 20 out the window to her and, and went to hand it to her. And I was looking straight ahead. She literally grabbed my hand with both hands and pulled my hand towards her. And I remember I, I at that point, I was like, holy shit. I turned and looked at her and she looked at me right into my eyes and she said, sir, thank you. Thank you so much. God bless you. I looked right back at her and I said, no, God bless you. Best of luck. I know it's only a small amount of money, 
but I hope it helps you. And she said, oh, you have no idea how much is this, this is going to help me. And I drove off. And, you know, there are so many times where people like myself and other people, and I'm not tooting my own horn. I'm just saying that when people call me selfish or all of us selfish, I mean, first of all, I fight against the vaccine, against the mandates. I'm fully vaccinated. I've gotten both shots. I've gotten the booster, Moderna all the way. And I'm glad I did it. I'm not uncomfortable with the fact that I did it. And I could go into a restaurant tomorrow in Boston and show my card and get and get dinner. I'm not going to do it because I don't believe that it's fair to require people who don't believe in the vaccination and don't believe in having to wear a mask that they have to show papers. So I am standing in solidarity with this peop- with these people, and I will not frequent these businesses that are doing this. And I am verbally standing up for people that are right now stuck like this police officer in Boston who felt that the vaccination was not right for her and right for her family. And now her life is being destroyed over these Gestapo type of um, mandates that have been coming out. So, you know, when they start calling us selfish and when they start saying that being free is selfish, that's a big concern for me. And that raises a red flag. I mean, how do you guys feel about that? Well, you've got the leader of our own country, you know, question or talking about freedoms like, come on, man, really? The president? demeaning our freedoms in America. This is what we have in the leadership of our land right now. True. I mean, it's crazy that that is what the leader of our country is putting out there. And that's the thing. If you, if you remember that, um, that, you know, when, when he first started, Biden was telling everybody that he was going to unite America. He was going to bring people together. He was going to unite the country. You know, he kept saying Trump was divisive. I'll still go back. And I know a lot of people out there don't like Trump. A lot of my friends don't like Trump. My wife doesn't like Trump. And, you know, if he had learned to maybe be a little bit more polished in the way he spoke to people, I think he would have gone down as one of the best presidents in American history. But a lot of the things he said irritated a lot of people and it allowed a lot of people to rip him apart. But the bottom line is Trump never had a chance. When Trump was elected president, the powers that be in the Democratic Party decided before he was even elected that they were going to impeach him. They said it before he was inaugurated, we are going to impeach Donald Trump. Donald Trump came in and he did exactly what he said he was going to do. He didn't lie. You know, he may not have been, you know, polished. He was rough around the edges. He said a lot of stupid things. But kind of like what I said about Jimmy Carter, when you look at Joe Biden, I compare him with Jimmy Carter is probably the worst president in the history of my lifetime that I've seen. But the difference between Joe Biden and Jimmy Carter was Jimmy Carter was just a bad president. He wasn't a bad man. I think he was a man that loved the country. I think he was a man that was a good American. He was a Democrat, but he cared about the people in this country. Uh, Donald Trump, same thing. I really deeply believe that he cares about the people in this country. He made us all aware of how deep the swamp is, and I think everyone's aware of that now. We've seen examples of it over the last you know, couple of years of even people on the Republican Party that are not loyal to what uh, people on the, on the Republican side want to do. So we're seeing a lot of that stuff. When, when I look at Joe Biden, you know, I, I don't even know if you can make a fair comparison because I look at the guy and say that he doesn't care about America, but I don't know if he's in his right mind. I mean, Joe Biden, to me, is a man with dementia. We've talked about this many times. I don't want to get on that road for too long again. But I mean, when he's yelling and screaming, is, does he even know what he's doing? When he's pounding the desk and yelling at people, I mean, I look at my dad, and I, I know John Gale has a similar situation. There have been days when my father loses it. And it's more so about his dementia than it is about what type of person he is. So to say that Joe Biden hates America, I mean, you can look at his history and see that he has a history of racism. He was friends with Dennis Byrd, who was uh, one of the heads of the KKK. Robert Uh, Robert Byrd, excuse me. Uh, He also uh, made a lot of comments about uh, he didn't want his kids being in school with African-American kids. It would be a racial jungle. (laughs) I mean, there were a lot of racist things that he said, even during this campaign, When he said, you know, if you are supporting Donald J. Trump, you ain't black. I mean, who is this entitled white man to be to tell a black person that you ain't black? I mean, who the hell does he think he is to make a comment like that? So to me, it makes no sense. Crazy stuff. So, hey, Kingzilla, I see that you called in. I want to give you a chance to talk. So uh, what are you calling in about? What would you like to talk about? Oh, yeah, I was just agreeing. It's just fucking sickening to um, exactly what you said. It's sickening. It is. 
It is. So, I mean, what, what do you feel about what's happening in Boston? We've been talking about that. And for the people coming in right now, thank you for coming into the show. I know the title says Jeff Moore from the More Money Podcast, but Jeff didn't make it into the show. So we're just kind of freelancing. And I'm going to do probably a 45-minute show, and we'll just move on, and we'll reschedule Jeff. If you guys want to talk about money, we can talk about money. I've got some ideas that I can help you with. <laughs> so maybe we'll even save that for the last 10 minutes of the show. We'll talk a little bit about money because my wife and I are pretty good at that, and we've been successful. So if any of you guys want to learn about money, uh, even though the Jeff didn't make it in, we could talk about it a little bit. But King Zelda, before we get to that, what would you like to say, I guess, about Boston and what's happening there? What are your feelings on it? You know, my feelings about that is just um, uh, I, I'm pissed off about that because, you know, my grandpa is a Vietnam person. And we was talking about that listening to your show just a minute ago. And, you know, he, he just wants to punch the guy in the damn face. Oh, you're, you're with him thinking. right now, your grandfather? No, we. I just got off the phone with him, but oh. I can, I can bring him with them next time. Make sure, um, make sure you tell him when when you talk to him. Tell him from John Devito specifically. Thank you for his bravery. Thank you for fighting for freedom. I know that the guys that fought in Vietnam were treated like dogs when they returned home. So I can't even imagine what that was like. I mean, that's almost like what's happening with the police officer in Boston right now, where she was a hero in the Boston Marathon bombing, and now she's been fired and they won't let her eat pizza in a restaurant with her family. I mean, the guys that fought in Vietnam, they came home and they were being called baby killer. They were being called all these horrible names. I mean, these guys went over to Vietnam to fight for our country, and then the media and the politicians threw them under the bus and they came home, you know, when they should have been welcomed home as heroes, they were, they were welcomed home as criminals and as evil people. And I mean, I, I can't imagine what it would be like to go over to war and even think about how scary that must be to put your life on the line. I mean, even if you're the bravest guy in the world, the bravest woman in the world, you go over there and you fight and you're facing death every day and you're seeing people killed in front of you constantly. I can't imagine what that does to you mentally. So if you could, please pass on to him how much respect I have for him and for what he did. And I never take for granted what the military did for me and what they've continued to do for me because I was never in the military. I played football in college and that was a tough enough sport for me. But for me... I cannot thank military people enough for the freedom that they've provided for me and the life that they have allowed me to live because of the sacrifices that they've made. And if people don't understand that, I mean, for the people out there that think freedom is just something we're entitled to in this country, that freedom is free, freedom is not free because there are a lot of countries out there. A lot of people out there and a lot of dictators out there that do not want us to have freedom. So please pass on to him how grateful I am as to you know the service that he has done for our country, because it really deeply means a lot to me. So if you could, I would appreciate that. Oh, yeah, no problem. Good. So uh, anyway, so you might want to talk about money for a little bit. That's what the show is supposed to be about. I can give you my impression a little bit. Why don't we spend the last 10 minutes? And I don't know, John, if you have anything you can put into this or Eric or King Ziller. But if anyone has any questions, we were expecting... Uh, Jeff Moore in. He couldn't make it today. And the podcast was supposed to be about money. We've been talking about politics a little bit. But let me give you a little bit of information that I have. And I'm not saying that, you know, I'm the end all be all of money. But I mean, I'm 54 years old. And my wife and I have had very good careers. And we did learn some very valuable things from our fathers and our family that have helped us a lot. And for anybody that's in here that's young, now, if you don't make a lot of money, it makes it harder right from the very beginning. I get that completely. So it's hard to put away money when you are trying to pay rent and trying to you know, buy food for your children and things like that. But I can tell you that one of the most important things you can do when it comes to money and retiring with money is start saving as early as you possibly can. If you're someone that works for a company and you get a 401k match. Now, for people that don't know what a 401k match is, a lot of companies offer these where you can put money into a group of uh, mutual funds, which are basically just a mix max of di different stocks that some company will put together. So you can put money into your 401k. That money is automatically put into it, like a mix of mutual funds that protects you from as much risk as if you'd be an individual stock. And then a lot of times companies will 
give you a match. So if you're putting in, say, 10% of your salary, then you get like maybe a 3%, 4%, 5% match from your company. And they give you free money basically on top of your salary. Now, the good thing about putting money in a 401k and the good thing about doing it when you're young is if you put money in a 401k, that money comes out before you pay taxes. So you are not paying taxes on any of that money that goes into the stock market and you're not paying taxes on any of the gains in that money that goes into the stock market until you retire and actually withdraw that money. So basically, if you're going to work for 30 years and you're putting this money out of your paycheck into the stock market with every paycheck, you're not paying taxes, you're being put into a lower tax bracket, you're paying less taxes overall. And then in the end, you do withdraw money and pay taxes, but then there are ways around that also. So this is basically a tax shelter that almost anybody can take advantage of. So if you work for a company that has a 401k, I would highly recommend at least putting the minimum of what the company matches into that because it's free money. Now, there are other things you can do. Now, we don't have Jeff here today, so I'm kind of giving you a few things. Hi, Mama, hi, Mama Bear. So I'm giving you a few things about money that I've learned over the years. Number one, start investing early. If you have a company 401k, invest in that. You can also put money in an IRA or a Roth IRA. Now, an IRA is an individual retirement uh, account. So basically, you can go to any major company like Fidelity, you know, I, I assume you could probably even do it on Robinhood. I, I buy my crypto on Robinhood. But if you don't have a company 401k, you can start up an IRA or a Roth IRA and you could put money into those. Now, the difference about an IRA and a Roth IRA is compared to a 401k, you pay taxes on the money before you put it in. So you are, you, you're already paying your taxes up front and then that money will also go into mutual funds and it will grow over time. Now, if you start, putting money into a, a 401k, a Roth IRA, an IRA, or any of those vehicles when you're working. And if you start when you're 18, 19, 20 years old, 25 years old, even putting a minimal amount, you know, 300 bucks a month, if you can do it, is enough to, by the time you're, you know, 67 years old, when you can retire, if you do that monthly for the rest of your life, you will retire as a millionaire. You will retire as a millionaire. I know that a lot of people out there, you, know, you think you're going to win the lottery. You think you're going to hit it big. But really, the best way to become a millionaire is to save over time. And, you know, in my family, my grandparents were immigrants. My father and mother worked very hard. They didn't make a lot of money, but they had some. And my wife and I, on both sides of our family, are the first people that really have had a decent amount of money. And we've done it by starting young and investing as much as we can. Now, this isn't going to be for everybody, but now I'm 54 years old and I'm allowed to invest even more right now into my 401k. So I'm investing the maximum amount, amount that I can invest, which is I think almost $26,000 a year into my 401k. So by the time, you know, I retire and by the time my wife retires, we'll never have to worry about money again. I mean, we're already millionaires and I work because I like working. I do this podcast because I can do it because if I get fired tomorrow, I'm not going to worry about it. And I do this, you know, as a, like a lunch break of my job every day. But and, I, and I'm not saying this stuff to brag, but I mean, again, I'm 54 years old. Our house is paid off. We have plenty of money. My wife and I could both retire right now. And the only I mean, there's a couple of reasons why we did it. Number one, we made decent money. And that obviously makes it easier because we have more disposable income that we can save. But on top of that, we have been very, very disciplined in paying ourselves first. Remember that if you have a job before you pay your bills, before you pay anything, always pay yourself first. Because if you're not paying yourself first, you are not saving money. And you, and you know, you, there, there are a lot of different ways you can cut back in your life. I mean, do you need a $60,000 BMW if you're making $40,000 a year? You know, do you need a $100,000 SUV if you're not making a lot of money? Do you need to buy, you know, $200 sweatpants or $300 sneakers? Or do you need the newest iPhone that's 1500 bucks? Or can you get by with an older one? If you're willing to sacrifice on some of these things that people buy in order to show everybody how rich they are, you can actually be rich if you don't buy those things, invest the money in the stock market and watch it grow over time. So pay yourself first. I know that people had tuned in today expecting Jeff Moore and he's not here. So I'm trying to give you a little bit of my knowledge anyway that I have. Now, you can also buy individual stocks. Individual stocks are a little bit more risky because let's let's be real, you know, Individual stocks scare me because I never have the inside information that people in these companies have. So unless you have inside information, which of course is illegal, it's very, very difficult to know what's happening with 
uh, companies. But one thing I can tell you is if you're looking at individual stocks, a few of the things that I've learned is you always look at the PE ratio. Now, if you don't know what that is, the PE ratio is the price to earning ratio. So that basically will tell you if you look at the PE ratio, and it's a low number, like suppose you were to look at Walmart, and Walmart's PE ratio is like 13.81. That basically means the price of their stock is pretty cheap compared to the earnings that they're bringing in, which means the stock is undervalued. Now, if you were to go look at GameStop and the PE ratio is 112, then that means the company is not nearly bringing in enough money to justify the price that that stock is at. So that means that basically you're buying into a company that's overvalued. And at some point, there's probably going to be a sell off. Now, again, you know, if you have like Facebook groups and uh, you know, different groups on Reddit that are pushing these stocks. I mean, that kind of throws that whole plan out the window. But just remember, if you're looking at an individual stock, if you want to look at one thing, and if you don't understand stocks, make sure you look at that PE ratio. That's the price to earning ratio. A low number generally means a company is doing pretty well financially, and they're bringing in a lot more money that justifies the low price of their stock than a high PE ratio that says that a company is not earning much, but their price is inflated. So that is something to look at if you're considering that. Now, one more thing I'll talk about, you know, regarding money is, again, crypto. Now, I'm not sure if anybody in here invests in crypto. I wish I had done it earlier. My 15-year-old uh, son told me about a year ago to buy a Dogecoin, and I was afraid to because I didn't know enough about it. And, of course, I missed the big jump from when it was well below a penny uh, down up to 73 cents, and I would have become a millionaire if I invested money. I would say to all of you now, like right now, I think I have uh, $50,000 in Dogecoin. So I've got, I don't even know, 350,000 shares of Dogecoin. But keep in mind now, with that money that I have in there, that is money that if I lose it, I mean, I'm not going to be happy. My wife will be pissed at me. But if we lose it, it's not going to affect our lives that much. I mean, we have money saved. And if we lose it, you know, we'll be pissed. But it's not going to take food off the table. It's not going to hurt our lifestyles. So I guess for any of you, if you're going to take on a really risky investment, make sure you can lose the money. Make sure you can afford it. I mean, don't go into debt. Don't be trading on margin. Don't be betting money that you don't have. You know, you, you can look at certain cryptos like maybe Shiba or some of the other ones that are really inexpensive where you can even buy some shares with like $100 or $500. But definitely do not spend money that you don't have. Make sure it's money you can afford to lose. Because when you're investing in a crypto, in my opinion, it's it's a risky gamble and you could very, very much lose your money. So, you know, for us, we're willing to take a little bit of gamble. I'm, I'm looking at this money saying, boy, if we really make this money, if, if this thing skyrockets and goes up to a buck, I'll have like $400,000 in crypto and I'll sell it. And that will help me pay for my kids college. Maybe we buy a second home someplace. I mean, this is just for me, you know, rolling the dice, playing craps, hoping, <laughs> hoping that it goes up. And that's the gambling nature that I have. And you have to have a strong stomach for that, because if you're playing with money, these prices go up and down. And I know my wife looked the other day and she's like, oh, Jesus, look at the price of those. We got to get out. And I said, we can't get out now. We're down. We need to stay in this. You got to have like kind of like a steel stomach to invest in some of those things. So other thing, one other thing I would I would suggest to anybody in here is yes absolutely john one of the things i would suggest anybody in here it doesn't matter how old you are i would consider even if you're married if you're single if you have children take out life insurance i think life insurance is a phenomenal thing you can buy it very cheaply it doesn't cost you a lot of money and like for me right now, if I were to die today, which I hope I don't, but if I do, boy, wouldn't that be something? All of a sudden, Eric Kirk comes on tomorrow. Boy, John predicted he was going to die, and he actually did. If so, you can all laugh. I give you permission to laugh about me dying if it does happen. But if you buy life insurance, you're like if I were to die today, my wife and my family get one million, well, actually $1.5 million from my two insurance policies. So for me, I've always thought about you know, if I die, who's going to help pay for my kids to go to college? Who's going to help them with their lives? Who's going to help my wife raise my kids? And that 1.5 million will go to my wife tax-free. So if you happen to pass away and you have an insurance policy for your children, they will get, you know, whatever it is, a $500,000 check, a $1 million check, a $200,000 check. They'll get it directly to them and you will not pay. They will not pay one penny in taxes on the insurance money. So the, the gray area is right. No one ever gets rich working nine to five. You're absolutely correct. The money that I've made in my life has been through the stock market. It's been through real estate. I've never lost money on a house that I've bought in real estate. I think we've profited on like four or five houses. I wish we had done it more, but you need to find a side hustle 
and get educated. I mean, don't go out there and just buy stocks from some company because you like them. You need to look at some of the financials and you, know, you could take a course and learn more about it. But at least I gave you that one thing, the PE ratio. So just to summarize what I was talking about, you know, kind of filling in for Jeff Moore a little bit since he didn't come in today is number one, put money in your 401k. If you don't have a pension, that is like your pension. And even if you put a little bit of money in, even if it's 50 bucks a month, you will have a lot of money down the road if you save that money for 30 years and the stock market continues to go up like it historically does. So 401k, an IRA, which is an individual retirement account, a Roth IRA, which is for people that have lower incomes, okay, where you can put money in and it grows tax-free over the years, but you do pay your taxes on that one before the money goes in. I would say mutual funds, but then also you can invest in individual stocks. But the one thing I did throw at you, if you forget, look up a PE ratio. That's something that will help you decide whether or not that stock's a good value. And the last thing I, I threw at you was life insurance. You know, if you're a parent, go out and get a life insurance quote. I mean, it might be 20 bucks a month for life insurance, but if something happens to you, whoever you're with, we'll get a nice big chunk of money and it'll be tax free. So that's it guys. Do you guys have any questions or anything you want to add? John King, Eric, anything you uh, want to add? I figured like we need yeah. to give uh, some people a little bit of money talk since that, that's what some of them were coming in for today. And we were going yeah. out of politics. Yes, John, I got something to say. Hey, go ahead. What do you got? You can't die until we had this conversation about the VNS implant. <laughs> that's true. You're right. And again, I'm, I'm hoping that I've got some time left. I mean, I am 54, but you never know. It could happen any day now. Oh uh, no. I will let God take you until I get this dang interview with you. That's what's going to happen. I'm going to, I'll, I'll be at the gates waiting to speak to God. And I will say, well, listen, can you send me back for one more day? Or can I do a podcast from here? Is there any way for me to log in from up here where I can have King Zilla on my show so we can actually talk? So I'll, I'll see what I can do, but I, I don't know. I think that the big man, if I do head up there, I think that the big man probably has authority and will overrule me if it's time for me to if it's time for me to be there. And, and quite frankly, I probably won't want to come back. It seems like in any of the near death experience I mean, stories I read, it seems like good, a pretty pleasant place Lord. to be. And I probably won't want to come back. Last last time you said we was doing this interview, I had four hundred and eighty four. Now I have five hundred and twelve because I've been like John DeVito invited me. Come <laughs> see me now. They're flying in like flies with these um listeners. Uh, when, when are you coming in? I'll, I don't know. I'm just waiting for it. Like tick tock, tick tock. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sorry. You know what happened to me? I, I really mean to get into shows more often. It's really hard for me. You know, I'm again, as I said, I'm you know 54. I've got my wife. We've got four teenagers. So for me, I have another full time job. Like today, when I get done with this, I have a Zoom call from one to four that I'm going to be on a three hour business call. And then after that, that's when I have to start driving my teenagers all over creation, my kids to work, to sports. So generally, I don't end, end up sitting down in my house until like 9 or 9.30 at night. And then my wife wants to watch Netflix with me. So a few times I will have my phone on with a, with a headphone in, in my chair watching Netflix with her. And she gets a little angry if she knows I'm not listening to her when she's talking to me. So if you're a married man, you know what that's like. When the wife's talking to you, you need to listen. Of course, when I talk to her, she ignores me. So I'm not sure how that's a symbiotic relationship and how that's fair at all. But Oh, that's fine. My, that's my wife wants stuff. sex. Uh, my last one. Oh, yeah. Your la Dude, I'll tell you. It, it is crazy when they get the license. My daughter got her license, and my son's going to be going for his shortly. And I'll tell you, this will be the last thing I talk about because I got to get moving. I get that call at 1 o'clock today. I have to prepare for it. But nothing is scarier, nothing, than being in a car, sitting in the passenger seat, with a person that has no experience driving. It is terrifying. My daughter's a good driver. You know, she's done a good job. But I'll tell you, the, the first few times I drove with her, the first time I took her into a parking lot and I was trying to teach her how to park and there was no cars, there was nothing. And she literally went to park and stepped on the gas instead of the brake. She jumped the curb and went up onto the grass and literally like kind of skidded the tires in the grass of the local elementary school. And I was like terrified because if she had kept going, we would have gone out into a main street and there was a lot of traffic on that street. So of course, when she jumped the curb at that point, I was like, Oh my God, Oh my God, break, please, please. And she luckily found the break and stopped us. The other good story was we were driving out on the road, you know, like a month or two later and she came up uh, to a rotary and for people not in New England, I don't know if everybody knows what rotaries are, but they're like circles in the road where there are like three or three or four roads that pour into the circle and you go around the circle and you have to go in which direction you want to go out to one of several different streets. Oh, yeah, you roundabouts, rotaries, uh, turnabouts, whatever you call them. 
So we went, we drove up to one and she hadn't seen one before. So she's like, oh my God, what do we do? Now at this particular roundabout, we had to basically go to about 12 o'clock on a clock and go on that road. So in essence, we had to go straight through, but we had to go around the roundabout. So I pointed to her saying, okay, that's the way we need to go, but we need to go around over here. And I was given visuals as to what we needed to do. Obviously, she didn't understand me. She started to drive straight and almost went right over the middle of the roundabout. A car honked at her. <laughs> and I was like, oh, my God, no, 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 not over the middle. So she luckily stopped, and then I was able to direct her. And, of course, she yelled at me. It was my fault that I didn't explain myself properly. <laughs> but, you know, it is what it is. So, anyway, listen, Eric and John, I'm going to wrap this thing up. John, do you, is there anything you want to say before you go? I really appreciate you calling in and, uh, you know, taking no, some of the show with me. me and, uh, what, what would you like to say? Why don't you advertise your show again really quickly, and then we'll go to Eric. Okay, yeah. At 5 p.m. tonight, we do conservative talk kind of a humorous twist a little bit. We have fun with it as well. So Monday through Friday, live streaming right here on Podbean. You can also check out my website, which is the John Gale program.com for more information. Yeah, that's good because I, you know, in addition to the live right now, we've got a few people in here. I've been getting doing really well with the downloads lately. I've been doing anywhere from 300 to a thousand downloads per episode. So for the people that listen on all the other platforms out there that download my show and listen that way, make sure you look for John Gale. He's very, very good. His show is amazing. If you like my show, you know, he's a little bit more low key than I am and probably, you know, is a little bit more politically correct than I am. And I think that that, sh that is a good thing. I wish I could be a little bit more like that. He's very professional and very good at what he does. And he also has a, a background, if I remember correctly, as a pastor. So if you're looking for someone that can give you a little bit of moral guidance also, he's very, very good at doing that. And he's really a pleasure to listen to. So I hopefully you all turn, tune into John Gale. So Eric, why don't I turn it over to you and you could just advertise some of the other shows and we will put a bow on this big boy. So go ahead, Eric, do your thing. And again, say anything you'd like also, if you want to talk about anything, Eric, before we get going. Well, I think this has been a great show today. Um, oh, I know, of course, Jeff Moore may have regrettably not been able to join us today, but yeah, those things happen. hopefully we'll try to reschedule his appearance. Because you know, if he's anything like me, I, I would have gotten the email later in the day and been like, oh, no, I forgot the podcast. So <laughs> it's probably what happened. Whatever. People get busy. We'll just reschedule and we'll have him on another time. But go ahead. Well, um, but I know in the Get to Know Your Podcaster series, we're looking forward to having Spanky and Scooter join us tomorrow, which should be a fun show. Um, and I think to a Patriot Mama, like I've seen like shells around, like she kind of acts as a secretary for Patriot Mama that, you know, she may not be able to join Monday, but she's open to joining Wednesday. But we're going to do a follow up email to let her know that 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 Wednesday might work for us. And we're also being the 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 lead host of Real Patriots Voice also joint joining that episode too. And coming up also on Podbean Live, you've got the um, old man's podcast with Dan Joe and Eric. They'll be back tomorrow morning, 10 a.m. Eastern time. You've also got um, the John Gale program coming up today at 5 p.m. Eastern time. But tomorrow, John will be on at a special time of 8 p.m. Eastern time. Um, Beans and Weenie show is on tonight at 8.30 p.m. Eastern time. Um, Slack Ready 2 Alpha at 7 p.m. Eastern. Um, you've also got, you know, the Frankie D show and Solid Blue Sister on in the afternoon. And you've also got, you know, the Dude Sean and Mike Tampa Bay, the It's Doomsday podcast, and, and a couple more friends coming up late, later in the week um, and, and impromptu shows. So be on the lookout for them and Shannon Lynn and, and you've also got the Ralph William podcast. He's on mornings here on Podbean and over on WESN, along with DeGray Area and Freedom Warrior, Linga Longa. Chuck and Billy's Not Your Cup of Tea, although it's going to be temporarily Chuck's Not Your Cup of Tea. And, and Chuck's also said something about doing the um, the a new season of the Inside the Morgue series with you, John. But that should really be fun. Um, and, you know, so many more great podcasts, friends worth checking out. And hopefully the Slightly Serious Show when James is starting to feel better. Yeah, how was he feeling anyway? I was kind of wondering about that. I mean, I think he's doing a lot better now, but I think he's, I think, still got to recover his voice. Oh, did, so he's, he has COVID. Has it been serious for him? Or did he lose, like, taste and smell? I, I don't think it was anything very severe. Um, but, you know, like, with B Billy's, like, COVID, from what Chuck had said, I think he really had the crud. Right. Well, I'll tell you, I, I don't know if I talked about this today. I'll make the, I'll make this really quickly. Um, basically everybody in my house, except for my wife has COVID right now. So we all have it and I have it and it's very mild. I mean, I have like a sore throat. If you can hear it a little bit, 
Um, two of my two of my boys are home from school. They're both you know fairly sick, not super sick. My daughter actually has it today as well, I believe. We all took COVID tests again yesterday, so I think we we pretty much all have it in my house. And you know, to me, honestly, it's not really much different from a flu. I mean, it's it's not pleasant, but it's not you know this horrible thing. So let's hope that we all get past this soon because, man, I think we're all done. So Eric and John and Ziller, thank you for joining my show. I greatly appreciate it. And uh, hopefully tomorrow we have, we have uh, the beans and when you guys uh, make it in. I haven't gotten an email yet from Jeff Moore. I'm sure we'll hear from him sometime later today. So to everybody who joined, it, joined our yeah. show, thank you very much for coming in. I really appreciate it. And we will talk soon. Take care now, everybody. Thanks, guys. Later, everyone. 